hip-hop i see hip-hop is like um the original lean startup um i see it as uh a cat a global catalyst for change um so it's more than just the music or the artists but it's actually um, a framework and a methodology Hi, I'm Shannon Lucas. And I'm Tracy Lovejoy. We're the co-CEOs of Catalyst Constellations, which is dedicated to empowering catalysts to create bold, powerful change in the world. This is our podcast, Move, Move Fast, Fast, Break Shit, Burn Out, where we highlight catalysts that are creating amazing change in the world. In this season of the podcast, we are diving deep into the skills that make catalysts successful. And I am so thrilled to have James Andrews here with us today. Uh, James has got this incredible background story that we will not even get to scratch the surface of today. So I um, suggest that you follow him online. He's an innovation artist who seamlessly blends his agency in the music industry with a pioneering spirit in technology. He's celebrated for elevating artists like Nas, Destiny's Child, and the Fugees at Columbia Records in the early 90s. And he now drives innovation at Creator Mode Studios. He's also an angel investor at Authenticated Ventures. Beyond technology, Andrews channels his creative energy as DJ Rich Cacao, creating immersive musical experiences. His journey intertwines entertainment, technology, finance, embodying the essence of a catalyst who continuously evolves, inspiring transform transformative growth in the creator economy and energizing audiences with his unique artistic flair, which you will get to experience. It's so good to have you here today, James. Likewise, great to be here. All right, I'm super curious how you uh, relate to the concept of catalyst. I um, resonate with catalyzing and being a catalyst because my um, career arc uh, is connected to hip hop, which is a catalyzing agent all in itself. Um, in many ways, <clears throat> if you follow the story of hip hop, it actually um, sort of is in line with um, not just who I am, but the way that I do business. It's a, it's a framework. In the 70s and 80s, immigrants from Jamaica um, and the Caribbean came to the South Bronx and um, they created this art form in, in the Bronx called hip hop. And, you know, many <clears throat> um, Jamaican men who in Jamaica were like engineers and sound people um, were the were the individuals that created this movement called hip hop, and there's a really famous photo by Jamil Shabazz in the Bronx where these 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 Jamaican kids are like they're not kids but they're men, but they're they're trying to find the red and the green wires and the light pole because they had to wire up the light pole, and that's kind of um, that's kind of indicative of like the way that I see my career, the way that I see hip hop. I see hip hop as like um, the original lean startup. Um, I see it as uh, a cat, a global catalyst for change. Um, so it's more than just the music or the artists, but it's actually um, a framework and a methodology. So um, yeah, that's kind of what I think about when I think about being a catalyst. Amazing. And also your role in helping to catalyze all of that as well. Um, so we'd love to understand, I mean, you've been wildly successful. People should ch definitely check out your LinkedIn profile, which will be in the show notes and the links. But um, what are one or two skills that have made you successful as a catalyst? Well, I think diplomacy. I think, you know, understanding, um, <laughs> understanding people, humans, um, at varying degrees or coming from various walks of life. When you work in hip hop in the 90s, you know, you're dealing with uh, a, a savory group of characters, you know, you're dealing with corporation, uh, at a, you know, I worked at, at Sony. Um, so you're, and even within Sony, you know, you couldn't even ride the elevator with the Japanese, like they would stop you. <laughs> you couldn't go eat at the Sony club unless you had certain status. Our first chef was, by the way, was Nobu, like the executive chef of Nobu. So we have like the equivalent of Nobu upstairs. And uh, um, even when we had our label meetings, which were a three hour meeting led by Tommy Matola and Donnie Einer, we would eat off plastic plates and like all the executives would eat off fine china. So even, you know, there were like subtle ways of letting you know, like this is where you are. So 
I um I learned very quickly moving to New York City and working, you know, sort of for the top record label in the business, diplomacy. You know, hip hop had a lot of savory characters. There were a lot of formerly incarcerated and a few drug dealers here and there. So you had to, you know, I had to balance my days of when I was rocking a jersey <laughs> or I was rocking a suit and tie. And um, I think I'm just as relevant in the Harvard club as I am Harlem. And so I think that's that, that ability to be a diplomat, a cultural diplomat, to understand nuances, to be street smart, but then also like Ivy League smart, I think is, a, you know, is a skill set that's done well. For, I've done well for myself that way. Can you give us, I mean, I, I, I love the images that you're giving, like the Harvard versus Harlem and the, the shirt versus the um, suit. Can you give us an example of how you use dis diplomacy to navigate a change that you wanted to create? Oh, gosh, every day. So <clears throat> many times um, I had to defend the budgets or the um, the opportunities for artists. Um and, uh, you know, you had to understand what was motivational, you know, what, like what motivated the Fugees, like what motivated Wyclef, right? And so <clears throat> I spent a lot of time with my artists. I got to know them. I ate with them. I went on, I went on trips with them. We, you know, we, we spent a lot of time together. Um, and then the other side of it is like understanding um, like executives and how to unlock budgets and how to, you know, make people feel like this was their own. So there was, I always wrote my marketing plan in three, three different ways. One was for the building. So can I get the building excited about my artists? And then the other marketing plan I wrote was for the industry. Can I get Billboard magazine? Can I get the local retailers, the national retailers? <clears throat> you know, the people who made things happen in the industry in 1995, pre-internet. It's important to note that. Uh, and uh, then the consumer. And when all three of those things were humming, both you know internal marketing plan, industry marketing plan, and um, consumer marketing plan, when those three things were working well in cohesion. Usually, that would be the sign of of a success. Like when the assistant to the big VP would go, "Oh my gosh, Wyclef just came into the building!" Right? I knew we had a hit. Right? When I when I could get the assistants excited, so I was very skilled at like understanding assistants. When you work in the entertainment business, you really have to understand like you're not getting to this agent or this manager or this big person unless you like are friendly with the assistants. So I understood assistants, um, but <clears throat> much of um, the music industry is about lobbying for budgets and lobbying for your artists and like defending them. Um, so there's a lot of meetings where you're standing up on a table screaming and, you know, yelling because you want to, you know, what you want your artists to not go out with a dat tape. They want to be a full band. And so it, 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 I learned at a very, at 25, which is when I worked in the music business, which was, which was my Harvard business school. I learned how, how, how to defend the budget, when to scream, when to use soft power, when to use hard power, when to like leverage my relationships. I really became a bit of a politician and I was trained under some amazing men. There's a <clears throat> men and women, actually. Um, the men in my life back then, one was um, a, a man named LeBaron Taylor, who was the first ever president of black music um, at a record label and, and taught me so much. He also went on to, to uh, be part of the Congressional Black Caucus. We used to do events in DC, DC every year. <clears throat> the other man later that would be extremely um, instrumental for me would help me understand diplomacy is a man named Clarence Avant. And Clarence Avant was known as the black godfather. And no one got a job in, in the music business without kissing his pinky. He was sort of like a powerful little man who lived in Beverly Hills who once worked for a contemporary of Al Capone. And there's a documentary about him called The Black Godfather on Netflix. I highly recommend it. But there's not a political fundraiser that happened in the city of Los Angeles that did not happen at the Avon House. He supported Carter, Clinton, um, Obama. He once negotiated a deal for Hank Aaron uh, with Coca-Cola. Um, and he just was this amazing man who I got to know in my teens. And then later I worked with because he became chairman of our board. So I, I learned about diplomacy and politics and navigating multiple personalities, some of them savory, some of them rough, some of them using lots of curse words, some of them having guns. Um, I learned all of that in the record business in a way that Harvard Business School would have never taught me. 
so fascinating and it's so spot on about um you know the the plight of catalyst because it's about identifying what i hear you talk about too is identifying the shared value like when you talked about your yeah. three pronged um Absolutely. you know business plan <laughs> approach and we often tell tell people it's not what you might consider the best idea that's going to that that you should go after it's the one that's going to make it to market that's going to win yeah. and you talk yeah. you know what i hear you talking about a lot is that how you bring people along i could and i also i love I was going to ask you, like, how did you learn the diplomacy? So I heard one was having great mentors, which is such a great uh, yeah. gift to the audience. Like, find people who can help you because we don't come out of undergrad understanding how executives of the biggest you know, record label in the world <laughs> think. Um, I'm wondering if you have like maybe one other suggestion for how um, Catalyst can learn diplomacy skills like you outlined. Yeah, well, I did come out of undergrad learning how big and I'll tell you why. I interned at UCLA at Sony and worked at a law firm at the same time. I literally worked in Century City, worked at it because my goal was to become an entertainment lawyer. My best friend's mother was Dionne Warwick. And when I got into the business, uh, I would hang out at their house in Beverly Hills and I would see like, like savory characters from Vegas and then like executives. And I was like, well, I'm not a savory character from Vegas. I'm more of an executive and the executives were usually lawyers. So I thought that going to UCLA and becoming a lawyer was my path. And um, I also double double majored in internship. I also interned and I would run across the Century City Mall into my other internship, which was at Columbia Records. And when I was at Columbia Records, I would literally just sit and listen to the, the radio promo guys talk on the phone because I, I wanted to figure out how they were gonna get you know, Michael Jackson's record played. And the art of getting records played was a diplomatic skill. So I, my internship was literally like contract law across the mall, like lawyers sitting me down and, and explaining to me like entertainment agreements. And then literally at Columbia Records, sitting for 45 minutes while, while Mar Maurice Warfield, amazing man, would talk to radio PDs and MDs and get them to um, get them to play records. And I think it's, it, to me, you learn those skills by observing the subtleties, right? Like, <clears throat> it, to me, um, what I loved about the guys in New York and the record business was the subtleties. Like in one sentence, they would tell me, "I'm the greatest thing in the business," and you're 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 doing a crappy job at the same time. Like in the same sentence, and there was a giftedness in their ability to motivate and yet push me to be better um, that only record guys could do. So I think it's just like watching the soft skills. I, 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 was a, I was the kid, the intern who had personalized stationery that had my monogram name on it. So anytime someone came into the law firm that I wanted to meet, I would send them like a monogrammed card. I'm obsessed with stationery, by the way, and like custom moleskin. This is my custom moleskin. Um, so I, I used to like find a way to make an impact with little subtle touches. And it, it really, it really worked, but I was very diligent about it. I was very like practiced in it, in like the art of like making an impact and, and making a connection. And I think it, I, I'm the same person today. I'm just, I, I, I love humans and I try to connect with humans because my work is global these days. While I'm not like pitching radio DJs or MDs on records, I am meeting with Emiratis and Royals you know, and talking to them. And maybe I don't understand royal culture. Maybe I don't understand what it means to be an Arab in, in Qatar, right? But I now do because I allow myself to smoke shisha with them and, you know, eat the food and, you know, and to, you know, to go to Mujulis and like to do the things that would actually allow me to go, I get you, I see you. Like I'm, I'm humble enough to realize like I'm out of my, out of my world. This is a new world for me. I love the openness, the curiosity, the like constantly sensing. Um, it's so powerful for Catalyst. And I have to say, like you um, very generously introduced me to one of your AI communities. And as I watch you introduce new people and you are so thoughtful about how you're introducing and starting to make those connections that you can then sort of let flourish. So I think great learnings for our Catalyst audience there. There's an art and science to gathering, whether it's 
online or offline. I completely believe in this idea of saloniers, like it's sort of French salon culture. There are these amazing women that hosted both politicians and artists and people. And I believe that we're moving into an era of saloniers that are digital and physical. And I'm one of those, but there's going to be a bunch of people who know how to catalyze, hello, catalyze people both online and offline. And so that's what I do. And that's one of my gifts that I w was able to take from the days in the record business. You're experiencing that now. I understand how to like bring people together and make them feel seen or like, you know, or, and, and make sure that I'm not like, I am a servant leader. Like I don't need to be the star of the show. I, that, that's my approach in the record business was always like, I'm not the loudest. I'm not the one who's always trying to get his name in the paper. I'm on a need to know basis. It's what <laughs> I love about Clarence Avon and my mentor. He's an amazing, his, the fact that he has a document, he's passed away about, about 60 days ago, but the fact that he has a documentary in Netflix is incredible because I would talk about Clarence Avon and people would think I was crazy. There was once a story, I'm gonna tell one story. Puffy, um, Puffy was DJing at Ron Burkle's house in Bel Air and uh, he's DJing and, and, and Clarence Avon walks in and he goes, my, I'm not going to say the total thing of what he said, because there's, there's some words in there I won't use, but Diddy's, Diddy's DJing and he goes, Clarence Avon in the house. And Clarence Avon walks over to him and says, son, I'm Clarence Avon. I don't do shout outs. Like, <laughs> that's that's who I am. <laughs> I don't do shout outs. You don't need to shout me out. Like, I don't need to be known. I, I you know, I have, I'm, I'm power but you don't need to know me. And that's the way I kind of move. I move in silence like lasagna as our friend Little Wayne likes to say. <laughs> and also the puppet master. I just love that you're just yeah. seeing all the connections and, and getting everyone to move. Um, what's your biggest challenge these days as a catalyst leader? Oof, my own uh, self limitations. How about that? Um, yeah, my own, you know, lies I tell myself that I can't do. Um, you know, I think I, 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 I can be, um, I can be, you know, really hard on myself, try not to use curse words, um, <clears throat> trying, I can be really hard on myself. And so I think that's a really, a, a big challenge is like, um, I've, I've transitioned into, into so many different, I've, I've been in, you know, music and venture capital and advertising. And, um, I don't even know what industry I'm in now. I guess I'm in the combination of all three of them, but it's, um, it's telling telling myself that like, even though my LinkedIn profile is like you, you don't you it may not make sense to you it makes sense to me, but but also just believing that I can achieve uh, more and not resting on like the things I've done and I appreciate that you guys have um, spoken so highly of me in my bio but like I'm 53 and I feel like I'm just getting started like I don't feel like I'm like I, sometimes I forget of the things I've done because I purposely am like moving on to the next thing, which can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. I don't, I don't stop sometimes and take an inventory. I think the second thing is, um, uh, like, I think when you're a technology catalyst, you can be way out ahead. Like, like in, tw in 98, when I was talking about this thing called the internet, they all thought I was crazy. And then I built a web one company, you know, and like went into web one and I was so far ahead. I think there's like this throttle of like, <clears throat> you know, like, yes, I just built my own GPT and I am like managing, you know, things through my GPT, but like speaking about it in a way that like, you're not um, alienating those who might be moving at a, at, a, at, a, at a slower pace. There's people on my team that are like, you know, I'm just like moving so fast. I'm, you know, to your point, I'm moving fast and breaking shit. Um, I'm moving really, really fast right now. And I want to be able to slow down and make sure like my team understands like this or why, you know, why, why I'm investing so much time in this particular thing or why I went to this conference or why I, you know, care why I mean, why I even built an Abbott Kinney Guild WhatsApp group of like AI people. And I, I know in my head why I'm doing it. Cause I can, I can see it. Like, I'm like, Whoa, I see it. I see where this is all going, <clears throat> but it's unfair to those around me to not like stop and share with them like hey i see this thing coming around the corner um i need to stop for a minute and explain to to the others the vision that i have and i i think that i have been solo ranger for so long it's it, it's really challenging for me sometimes to like stop and explain and and the downloads 
and the insights are happening so fast, especially in technology that like, sometimes I'm like, you got to just keep up, you know, like if you can't keep up. Um, but I realize that like, and I, this is something I would tell myself is like, okay, if I have all this knowledge or have all this innovation excitement and I can't like motivate my team or motivate other people, then I'm just like on an island by myself and it's just silly. And I've done that a few times in my career and I'm trying now to really stop and go, okay, let me make sure my team sees, you know, why I'm excited about AI agents this morning, you know, and and why they should too. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the classic catalyst leader challenge for sure. I mean, even, you know, we're all leading change wherever we are in the organization. I want to start with the first one that you said though, because when people like look, I mean, they already heard your bio and when they look at you and they look at all of the stuff you've done for you to talk about like the self limitations at like a, I think it's helpful for people because like, you know, no matter where you are as a catalyst, imposter syndrome can be real, which can can hold us back. Um, how do you get yourself out of that self-limiting talk? Mm -hmm. Well, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I've spent the last um, two years confronting um, authenticity. I named my company Authenticated. And I realized I never really even defined the word authentic. And I was like, wow, like I'm a fraud. Like, I, like so I wrote, a, I wrote a Substack blog post calling myself out um, on authenticity. And um, I realized that was the catalyst. Wow, keeps coming up. Um, <clears throat> that was a catalyst towards two years of like deep, um, uh, let's say self work. Um, and um, I wanted to understand like all the things, like what, what were the things that held me back? What were those stories I was telling myself? What were the traumas that I was working through? What are the mother wounds? What are the father wounds? What's masculine energy? What's feminine energy? All the things. Um, I wanted to understand it at like a deeper practical level versus being able to be at a, at a cocktail party and talk about David Dita, but like actually understand like masculine and feminine energy, like actually practice it, actually, you know, read my emails through the lens of like, am I sounding, is the energy, what does it feel like when I write these words, choosing the, actually the words, eliminating words like should, um, actually down to that level uh, so that you feel it in your body, so that you feel it, what we would call somatically. Um, and to heal myself at my nervous system, to actually, I mean, I don't think I even knew what a nervous system was like three years ago, um, but to really understand uh, your nervous system and understand like what you're bringing to a relationship, what you're bringing to a business deal, because, you know, you're, you don't turn your, your nervous system off when you go to work, you actually take it with you and you bring that energy, um, you know, into a meeting. And I now, because I can sort of feel my nervous system and I'm in touch with it, I understand when I'm sitting across from someone where their nervous system is. Um, so I think, yeah, it's it's down to that level for me, which I, yes, the daily practices now include um, a gratitude practice. Um, I'm not consistent, I'll be honest with you. I'm consistent this week. Um, so I recognize though, without a practice, like this isn't just something I did for two years and like I'm gonna throw it away, it now becomes my life. So, um, and it becomes like also like, who I want around me. I want people around me to be doing the work. So one of the groups you're not in actually is called Becoming the Dopest and it's a men's group. Um, <clears throat> I, jo I joined a men's group and I actually started a men's group because I actually feel that men um, in particular need to be around healthy men. Um, and I found myself not in any containers of men. And so when I started doing personal work, um, I realized like, wow, like, <clears throat> I got to like bring men around me um, and particularly men of color. Like there's, uh, in all of the like personal development work I was doing, there were rarely any black men in that, in that. So I think like understanding my nervous system, understanding the power of being in community with um, other men, I've, I've lost, um, you know, two or three friends to suicide. You know, it's, it's real men are suffering out there. And um, 
I just wanted to surround myself around men. So we get to these, these moments where you have imposter syndrome, where you're like, I feel like a fraud. Like, wow, you know what? Like my wife is getting on me. My girlfriend's getting on me. My sister, like I, my, my work balance is off. And all the things that you talk about, like instead of just taking that home or taking it to a dark place or taking it to the bottle or taking it to more sex or more whatever, like you actually have a place to actually like feel it to actually contain it, to actually like confront it. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of, that's who I've become in the last couple of years is like someone who's not afraid to call my, myself out. Not like beating myself up, but like knowing that that like I'm called to, to more greatness than the way I'm operating and surrounding myself around people who call me on my shit, like who tell me like, you know, being accountable. Being accountable, I think is like, I don't think I was really accountable to much um, and accountability um, and integrity, I think, have become really, really important um, values for me as a leader. That was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing so vulnerably and authentically and open uh, on a personal note. We need more leaders like you as the mother to, um, to five boys, six boys total. Uh, you know, everything that you just shared, we need more of. So thank you for sharing so authentically and vulnerably. Broke a lot of shit to get here, but yes. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, but that's the point. We want to pass on the lessons learned so that yeah. people can learn from us, right? All right. I know that we're running out of time. So Tracy, I'm going to hand it over to you for the rapid fire round. It is incredibly courageous to go on the two-year journey you just went on, James, and even more so to share that publicly here. So thank you for both sure. of those things. Thank you. All right. Rapid fire. What is one thing that you do to be ready for a big meeting? Oh, uh, one thing I do to get ready for a big meeting is uh, meditate. Yeah. Say more. Uh, meditation allows me to hear is, is sort of the the pauses between the sentences and allows me to like capture the essence of a meeting the essence of a room the to stop and actually like <clears throat> feel like what's going on and I think that I um I actually like nervousness energy I, I always say like I embrace the bubbles like the nervousness bubbles like whether it's a speech, a keynote or whatever. And I think uh, meditation allows me to like appreciate that feeling of like, oh gosh, and turn it into like excitement, not being scared. Like, hell, this is exciting. Like I've seen what's going to happen on the other side of this. I know I'm going to be victorious. I know it's going to all work out. Even if the projector doesn't work, the slides don't work. It doesn't even matter because I know my stuff so well. I'm just going to crush it. Like it's not, I don't even, those slides are just there, but I got this. And like, I've had this happen. So <clears throat> I think like meditation allows me to like remind myself, like you got this. I got you. We got this together. Like feels like you have a teammate when you're when you're meditating. Was that part of your <laughs> natural routine before this two year journey? Yeah, actually, it was. That part I will say. Like I've I've been, um, well, I've been someone who appreciates the the game time jitters. Like I I because I came from entertainment. Like I I kind of. I like, I had a nervous system that was ready for like, let's go. It would be, you know, one time I worked with this group called Crisscross. There was two, if you're familiar with who they are, <laughs> they had a big song called Jump. Yeah. And one of the Chris's didn't show up for Madison Square Garden show. And like, I'm sitting at Madison Square Garden and like, he's not here. And I was like, so I was ready to just throw on the jacket and pretend and go, I, I, but that, that's who I was. I was like, let's go, I'll do it. And he showed up. I don't but like, I... I'm ready for game time. I'm ready for the big stage. Like I, I know what it, you know, I know I worked on the Grammy awards when I owned my agency. Like I understand the moments, you know, the moments and I, I want that, but I also understand that like, um, I hate roller coasters by the way, but like, I, it feels like you're just jumping on a roller coaster and just being able to present yourself and go, okay, Nothing bad's going to happen. Like this is going to all work out. Mm -hmm. And I've, yeah, I've sort of had that, um, that, uh, that, that ability to be present um, in the big, on the big stages um, uh, for my whole career, really. That's a gift. 
Yeah, it is. It's a blessing. What is your favorite way to spend a free day? DJing. Say more. <laughs> yeah, I'm the greatest DJ in venture capital. It's a low bar. Um, <laughs> I'm a, no, I'm actually giving myself a revenue goal this year. Uh, I'm building a tokenized community with DJ Jazzy Jeff. And uh, we launch in two weeks. And you will become a member. And as a member, you'll learn all these business skills from myself and DJ Jazzy Jeff. And as a part of this, I've been DJing for probably a decade, but when I turned 50, I gave myself a DJ name, which is DJ Rich Cacao. At the time I had 2.5 million followers on Clubhouse. So I was like, wow, like I can DJ in front of more than one person. So I'd have thousands of people that listen to me DJ for hours during the pandemic. And I, um, I decided this year that I'm gonna take it seriously. And uh, I'm searching for a manager. So if anybody's listening, even though I could manage, but I'm terrible at managing myself. And um, I have done, I have a regular event I do at Soho House. I DJ George Clinton's birthday party. I'm on the TED circuit. Um, I'm a part of TED. I do the official TED a uh, after party in Vancouver um, with a crew I have and WhatsApp as well, by the way, all my TEDsters. Um, so yeah, so I have been known kind of on the conference circuit for doing DJ gigs, you know, but now I'm taking it to the next level. And so I gave myself a revenue goal. And as a part of that, I also just like want to dig into music. I, I play everything from, you know, 90s hip hop to 80s alternative Depeche Mode, Thompson Twins to like Arab music and like, you know, Iranian Persian wedding music. Like I literally could be the greatest Persian uh, wedding DJ in the business right now because I know Persian music better than Persians. And they'll tell you that they, they do. So, um, so yeah, like I, I like digging in the crates. I'm a digger, you know, but the crates are digital now. So, but I also like vinyl. I like digging in vinyl crates. I mean, I hang out with people who like are crate diggers, but Jazzy, I used to manage Jazzy Jeff and some of my friends are DJs. So like, I love um, music. Um, I'm also in Taekwondo right now. So um, I'm obsessed with punching and kicking things. Um, and so I've earned a few belts and I really appreciate um, what martial arts has done for me. It feels like you've had a million careers. I know. I, I don't like, it's my, I don't see it that way. I just see it as like the blessing of like all these opportunities. Like if the world is this oyster, like why not like take up Taekwondo 52 or why not? Like, and, and I also, um, I also, uh, you know, I, I mean, we didn't talk, I worked at a very high level in advertising. I started an advertising agency, uh, sold it. And I don't know, like I, I wanted to understand the nomenclature of like how Coca-Cola procures digital business. And I, and I work at music and most people, and even people listening to this podcast right now, when you have my background in music, people are like, oh my gosh, you hung out with celebrities. No, I managed p &L. <laughs> Like I ran right. a business. Like, yes, I hung out with Destiny's Child and the, and the Fugees, but like I ran a business. And yeah. so I found that like people were getting enamored by the celebrity part of my life, but like I wanted legitimacy. So I thought going into advertising would be the right thing to do. So I worked at Omnicom. I started an agency after working at Ketchum PR. And then I wanted to understand like what an RFP was, what an RFI was and how it works and the language and all the things. And so it just required me to spend 12 years in, in advertising because I actually wanted that as a part of my journey, as a part of my, I look at life as academia. And like, that was just like the, that was the advertising, you know, uh, degree I got, you yeah. know, and my latest has been venture capital. I spent seven years unpacking capital, understanding. I speak the language now, I understand you know, what a family office does. I understand, you know, venture funding. And, um, and so, yeah, that's kind of been my last seven years has been like, okay, let me understand this. And I just go in with a beginner's mind. Like, I don't like each tell, time, each time, like, okay, tell me like, who? let me sit with the VC friends. I know what's it. Why did you do that? And why say, but it's a, I'm the same kid who was in century city listening to the radio promo guy. I'm just listening to VCs evaluate deals. Like, why did you ask that question? Okay, what's that about? Okay, okay, what's diluted? Like, why? Oh, you got a board seat. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Learning, learning, so, learning, 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 learning. I, I figure out what I'm gonna do next. I want to run a country, maybe. I don't know. Okay, well, we'll be watching. <laughs> Let's go. All right, last rapid fire question. Yes. Favorite famous catalyst, alive or dead, and why? And it can be Clarence. That's okay. And you guys gave this to me uh, as a as a as a lead in. Famous, yeah, hands down. 
Ah, Clarence Avant was amazing, man. That guy, I'm so blessed. He literally told me the same Sidney Poitier, Harry Belafonte story for, for you know, 25 years about running through the South of France. Like, I, um, I am so blessed and I highly recommend go watch The Black Godfather. It's an incredible documentary. But what I learned about Clarence, you know, through Clarence, um, he has two kids, one um, Alex Avant, the other Nicole Avant, um, our former ambassador to the, to the Bahamas, uh, married to Ted, for, uh, the CEO of Netflix. Um, and so what I learned from Clarence is also just passing along your your gifts to your kids. Um, he, he and Nicole is like Clarence, basically. Uh, one of the top fundraisers in the city, political fundraisers. Um, now she and, and Ted, of course, are the power couple in Los Angeles. And um, it's been really amazing to watch his daughter like take take on like that. And, and I know that's all Clarence and Jackie, his wife, who unfortunately was murdered in her house in Beverly Hills about a year ago. Um, and I And I learned just like, you know, this guy lived such a life, um, but and would curse a lot. You'll see that if you watch the documentary. <clears throat> but you know, he really like locked in with you. And, you know, I, and 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 in his old when he, when, he, when he was, I went to his star on walk. He got a star on the Walk of Fame in Hollywood, and he could just look at me and, and say he didn't even say any words that day. And he looked at me. He's, he looked at a guy who was like his right hand guy, and it was almost like spend more time with him. It was like, it was like the most subtle thing. I hadn't seen him in years. And I want to have that same effect. I want to have that same effect. And I want to have that same effect that my kids can walk into an office and someone says, you're James Andrews daughter. I know exactly who you are, you know? And, and what do you leave besides uh, your, your, your kids? You can leave them money. You can leave them, um, you know, social capital, right? Like really like relational capital. And hopefully I've done that where I've left my kids something beyond just a will, you know, that they have like uncles and aunties around the world. That's a beautiful aspiration. So as we wrap up this conversation today, which has me inspired and definitely Black Godfather's top of my list, in 10 seconds or less, James, what is your call to action for our audience? Oh, my call to action is remove the doubts, um, kick down the limitations, um, be humble, be a great listener, and uh, change change things, break things, and um, <laughs> and live on the other side victorious. Yes, <laughs> amazing. Bottom line. Thank you so much for being here with you, with us, James. It has been yeah. a highlight for me to get to spend time with you today. Amazing. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. And totally, we're going to put the link to, it's on Netflix, uh, the movie. And so we'll put that in the show notes. And yes, I'm going to put it on the family watch list. Oh, good. It's family friendly. <laughs> to our listeners, uh, be sure to check out our book, Move Fast, Break Shit, Burn Out. And if you have other catalysts in your life, hit the share button and send a link their way.